As Peter Stefan de Ponsu, Baron von Steuben's personal secretary, strolled through Valley Forge one May morning in 1778, he was astonished to hear a beautiful French opera being sung from the woods. Mesmerized by the captivating voice and feeling a wave of homesickness wash over him, the young Frenchman searched the tree line for the source. What he discovered left him stunned. The man he found was an imposing mixed-race man wearing a continental dress uniform. The cultured young Frenchman was astonished. Recounting the experience, years later, Dupontsu wrote, He would have been a valuable acquisition to the French opera, where I have never heard a voice of such extraordinary power and at the same time susceptible of modulation. I heard he was in the service of the United States and had the rank of colonel. In what manner he was employed, or what became of him afterwards, I never knew. All I can say is that I parted with him with much regret and never saw him since. The man who captivated the young aide that morning was the only man of African-American ancestry to be granted an officer's commission in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. He served throughout the war, fighting at the battles of Saratoga and along the shores of Lake Champlain. His is a story that bears repeating, so today we will look at the incredible, if forgotten, story of Lieutenant Colonel Cook. Welcome to America's Forgotten Founders, where we will look at people whose contributions to the American Revolution, whether on the battlefield, in the halls of power, or on the home front, have been all but forgotten by the annals of history. Before we begin, a brief aside. This video will have several Abenaki, Mohawk, and French names throughout. I am not fluent in any of those languages, and despite my best efforts, I will probably butcher some of the pronunciations. With that out of the way, let us begin. Sometime around 1740, the man who would go on to become Colonel Lewis was born Niaman Rigunant, which roughly translates to variegated bird in Abenaki, to a black father and an Abenaki Native American mother. Variegated means exhibiting different colors, especially irregular patches or streaks. Perhaps his name symbolized being a mixed-race child. His family lived near what would become Schulerville, New York. When Cook was still very young, his family was captured during a 1745 French Mohawk raid into colonial territory. A French officer, Mr. LeCorn, originally planned to enslave the boy. His mother pleaded with the officer to let the boy remain with her. The Mohawk warriors serving with the French supported the young woman. The officer relented, and young Niaman Rigunant accompanied his mother and his captors to Kanawake, a Mohawk village south of Montreal. The boy was adopted by a Mohawk family and renamed Akia Tonharon Quen, which translates as, he unhangs himself from the group. The boy grew up learning the Mohawk language and customs. Because the village had a Jesuit mission nearby, young Aki Tonharonquen learned to speak, read, and write English and French. After his mother died, he agreed to live with a Jesuit missionary near the village. When he reached adulthood, the young man officially converted to Roman Catholicism, being baptized either Colonel Lewis or Lewis Cook. After his baptism, Colonel Lewis Cook returned to live with the Mohawk of Kanawake until the French and Indian War broke out in 1754. The young warrior marched to war alongside the many Mohawks who fought alongside the French. Though records are scarce, a friend of Cook the mixed-race missionary Eliezer Williams would later write that Cook fought at several famous battles, including Braddock's defeat in 1755. Cook later fought at the Battle of Fort Oswego in 1756. Later that same year, he was wounded in a skirmish near Fort Ticonderoga by Rogers Rangers. In 1758, the bright and ambitious Cook 
was given his first command at the Battle of Carillon. We don't know what unit he commanded, but the battle was a ringing French victory, and Cook was allegedly praised directly by the French commander, General Montcalm. He commanded his men at the Battle of Saint Foy in 1760 near Quebec. The ultimate French defeat disheartened the young Cook. He became increasingly alarmed as more and more British settlers encroached on his people's land. He moved away with his new wife, Marie Charlotte, to a Mohawk village near Quebec. Despite identifying as a Mohawk throughout his life, Cook broke with his tribe when the American Revolution began. He opted to side with the 13 colonies alongside the Oneida and Tuscarora. His hatred for the British, who he blamed for settling on his people's lands, turned out to be more important than tribal loyalty. The battle-hardened Cook offered his services to General George Washington in 1775. He and a band of Oneida warriors accompanied the ill-fated Quebec expedition in 1775. Cook, despite being ill, successfully retreated with the remaining Continentals. Throughout 1777, Cook commanded a sizable band of Tuscarora and Oneida warriors at the battles of Saratoga and the Battle of Oriskany. In the spring of 1778, Lewis accompanied an Onega delegation to Valley Forge. Reportedly, he impressed the Continental Army officers. He was tall, good-looking, intelligent, well-mannered, and cultured. In 1779, Cook was sent with his band of warriors to destroy British ships on Lake Champlain. While this was his primary mission, he was also to keep an eye on Joseph Brandt, a British-aligned Mohawk leader in the area. The two would engage in a personal war. They became bitter, lifelong enemies. Halfway through the year, in recognition of his services, the Continental Congress officially commissioned Cook a lieutenant colonel in the Continental Army on June 15, 1779. It was the highest rank awarded to a Native American during the war and the only commission granted to a man of African American ancestry. Cook's fluency in English and French proved invaluable for his people diplomatically. He personally led the delegation to greet General Rochambeau on his people's behalf in 1780. His ability to speak perfect French shocked the French and Continental officers alike. Later the same year, Cook fought at the Battle of Clocks Field near St. Johnsonville, New York. Reportedly, Lieutenant Colonel Cook accused his superior... Brigadier General Robert Van Rensselaer of cowardice and treason for refusing to pursue the retreating British Mohawk force, commanded in part by his rival, Brandt. Cook's last action would come during the Battle of Johnstown in October 1781. The battle was one of the last engagements in the northern theater of operations. With hostilities in the north wrapping up, Cook settled in the Oneida village of Onondaga, near Sterling, New York. His wife likely died sometime during the war because the lieutenant colonel married Marguerite Thewani Hatha shortly after arriving. She would prove to be his great love, and the two would go on to have several children together. Due to his fluency in English, French, and Oneida, the Oneida tribe often had him represent their interests in negotiations with the new American government. Cook played a crucial role in convincing the Oneida to lease almost 5 million acres of land to a Colonel John Livingston for 999 years. While Cook and the Oneida thought they'd be collecting money on the land in perpetuity as landlords, the state of New York thought differently. To them, the Oneida had sold the land. The state evicted the Oneida by force from much of the land, incorporating the territory into New York. When asked for justification, the reply was that many Iroquois had fought with the British. Cook's, as well as his people's, service went unrecognized. While Cook attempted to negotiate with Governor George Clinton for the return of, or compensation for, their land, the resultant Treaty of Fort Schuler gave nothing more than minor financial compensation to the Oneida. 
While some later writers argued he negotiated out of bad faith, I find this incredibly unlikely. He was devoted to his people, and being Mohawk, the Oneida were brothers. Despite their cultural differences, both were members of the Iroquois Confederacy. It's more likely that Joseph was unaware of how the Americans would exploit the treaties. He didn't equate the Americans with the British. Despite this failure, Cook was the best representative the Iroquois had. He spoke multiple languages, was a Roman Catholic, and a former Continental Army officer. Between 1792 and 1796, Cook represented the Seven Nations of Canada six times in negotiations with New York, all relating to the illegal sale of the Grand River and Tyendinaga villages. Despite his best efforts, New York prevailed in keeping the land. By this time, Cook and Joseph Brandt, his old adversary during the Revolutionary War, were the two most influential leaders of the Confederacy. The two were diametrically opposed. The Iroquois were on the brink of civil war. By 1789, Cook and his wife resettled to Aquesasne along the St. Lawrence River, where Cook became a powerful chief. Despite the bad land deals, Cook convinced his people to remain neutral during the War of 1812 between the United States and the United Kingdom. Despite declaring neutrality, the United States detained his people at Fort Niagara, fearing they'd ally with the British. Chief Cook and his people were only released from custody after he produced his officer's commission and personal letters from George Washington. Perhaps to inspire his people and appease the United States by demonstrating his, and thus his people's, loyalty, he traveled with the U.S. Army to Canada in 1814. During a skirmish after the Battle of Lundy's Lane, he was thrown from his horse and died from his injuries in October 1814. He was buried with full military honors near Buffalo, New York. He is a tragic hero, his story marked by achievement and sorrow. He rose through the ranks when few mixed-race men could have. He earned the respect if not admiration of his fellow officers on both sides of the conflict. His military record speaks for itself. He was a man who stood apart from his contemporaries. He pushed the boundaries of what was possible for a person with his origins. But we can only ascend so far. What goes up must eventually come down. You either die a hero or live long enough to see yourself become the villain. His legacy has been tarnished by the land deals he negotiated with the state of New York. Much of the Oneida were forced to abandon their ancestral lands and move to Canada, never to return. In the end, Cook's life serves as a powerful reminder of the extreme abuse and exploitation that the United States of America would inflict on the Native Americans regardless of their services, contributions, or allegiances to the new nation. A nation, we must remember, they didn't receive citizenship in until 1924. I hope you find this video both informative and exciting. Make sure to like, subscribe, and comment. And join us next time as we look at our next forgotten figure, the first Supreme Justice of the United States Supreme Court, John Jay.